Oh, hi there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger. This is episode number 212, Dos Uno Dos. That's Dos Uno Dos with me, your host, Agostino Zinger. What's happening? What's happening? <laughs> How you doing, people? I'm happy to be back, glad to be back, over the moon to be back, in fact, in this lovely hot seat somewhere in the depths of Stratford, surrounded by um, the smell of, you know, an omelette that I probably overcooked, um, a couple of sausages, um, some steam from the shower I just had, and if you look outside the window, which you can't see here if you're listening via the podcast app, if you're watching via YouTube, you still can't see it, um, a window that is covered in smog and weather that looks like it's going to get worse as the day progresses. But what can we do? We live in London, which is in the United Kingdom. We should be used to this shitty weather already. But I guess not, because I'm still complaining. But anyway, hope you guys are well. Hydrated, rested, limbered up, and all that malarkey. Your joints are where they need to be. Um, you've got good mobility. Hope you haven't got out of bed this morning and you had those kind of ah, uh, ah, oh, ah, 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 pains, right? Hope you just got out and you just walked to the toilet. And then you just, you know, pulled out your little python. Or, you know what I mean? Or you sat down and opened your little oyster and had a good little piss, you know, for the morning, you know? Just to kind of, like a, like, a, like a salutation piss. That's what you usually do in the morning. You salutation piss. Oh, God. What a crazy night I had, right? Crazy dreams. Just, you know, let it all out with the urine. You go to the kitchen, fix up a little cuppa of nice, you know, dark beverage, which I have here, you know? Also known as coffee. And you chug that nice black tar down your esophagus and you hope that it kickstarts your day but if that doesn't happen or if it hasn't happened just yet hope you still get around to it you know drinking coffee that is not urinating on yourself just just so you're aware anyway um yeah man happy to be back i'm really oh this is all warm now you know when you drink making coffee and it goes to and it just goes um warm temperature and shit because you left it annoying but you don't want to whack it in america because it artificially heats it up and it kind of destroys all the taste whatever anyway so I've just got back from Paris, Gay Paris, as I mentioned um, last week. I went on a little weekend trip, you know, a little weekend break to keep myself active, to keep myself alive, to make sure I wasn't going crazy, to make sure that I was who I said I was. <laughs> no, um, we went especially just to go see some friends who've now lived there, who've been living there for ba- I best, I think maybe just over six months. The other, because um, they're a couple, I think the other dude, he's no, he's he's a he's a Parisian. Um, and he's kind of moved into his parents' house, who've kind of uh, sadly passed away, but he's inherited an amazing apartment, which they're currently uh, fixing up. And then the other guy is like, and, um, he's from Spain, but he moved there as well quite recently too, to kind of, you know, hook up with his partner and settle down into quote-unquote post-marriage life. So we got to stay in their amazing apartment in the middle of Paris. And, um, I'd basically say it was right in the center of Paris, a stone's throw away from the Champs-Élysées and all that malarkey. Just a great, great, great apartment, great location. And again, for me, having been to Paris a few times, specifically, um, the last time I went there was to go see Virgil's show, the kind of, I think, the maybe the second menswear show he had um, for Off-White. And that was a pretty good time, don't get me wrong. I, I wasn't there long enough. I was there for like a day and a half. I kind of came in on the Eurostar late at night, which, you know, I had to go straight to bed because there's nothing, literally, Paris is a weird let, let's, yeah, let, let's talk about Paris, right? Paris is a strange place because for some reason it's one of the it's, it's um aesthetically and landscape wise and architectural wise it's probably one of the most beautiful cities you're ever gonna encounter in your life right it's amazing it probably only pales in comparison maybe to places like Rome and Milan you know those kind of places I'm sure I haven't been there but I'm, I'm assuming seeing the Colosseum that kind of thing is gonna blow you away right but there's something quite magical about Paris about France in general. You know, they've got a bit of a mystique about them. They're a bit stuck up their own ass, but it kind of adds to their appeal, right? So you go there and you're like, wow, amazing city. But then for some reason, unlike any other city in the world or most metropolitan city, especially a city like Paris, we're not talking about Brighton or Bristol, even though Bristol probably is, is, is probably um, above Paris in this regard. Everything shuts at like 11 o'clock or 12, right? Everything shuts down. And I don't mean like, um, I don't mean just, you know, bars and clubs. I mean everything, and I, and I never knew how much of that could really affect the way you experience a city at night. Because sometimes, especially if you've been to New York or you've been to London, which is probably two really extreme examples, but let's say a Berlin, for instance, right? Not everything closes at nighttime, right? Some things stay open. Like you might there might be an off-license, a couple supermarkets or mini-markets, um, 
I don't know, there might be a liquor store open. There might be a random bike shop. There'll be just stuff open that just keeps the overall, you know, landscape looking alive, right? But when everything shuts, like off licenses and post post office shuts anyway in regular time, um, outside of all the regular stuff that closes at the usual time, like banks, post offices and all that malarkey, when all that stuff closes down, even the bars that are open don't seem like they have a vibe in them, right? They just seem completely dead. It's like they purposely force everyone to go home or people just go home in general, which is very strange because, you know, France or Paris has um, all the ingredients necessary to have a really vibrant nightlife culture, right? They have some great buildings um, with some amazing interiors, high ceilings. You can imagine people putting on crazy warehouse parties in there, right? Um, they have access to some of the best wine you've ever had in your life, right? Great beverage, great liquor outside of the wine as well. Um, great beer culture too, which is something you don't really associate with Paris, but the beers there are really good, especially if you go to, we went to a couple craft beer places that were serving some amazing, amazing, amazing beers on tap. Um, so it's got all the ingredients for it, but, and, you know, a, a rich history of music, especially electronic music, right? It's the home of electro for some reason, uh, for, um, for all intents and purposes. Um, the birthplace of Daft Punk, you know, um, Brodinsky, you know, all those dudes, B, uh, Busy P. But yet, there's not really a vibrant nightlife. It's a very, very strange place. Um, that aside, beautiful. Um, as I think, as most of you people are aware, or as most people are aware, there is a distinct difference going to a place, especially a metropolitan city, especially a popular destination, by yourself. And there's a big difference going to a place. Secondly, again, when you go um, to visit friends, right? And they show you around their city. You have such a better experience. It's so much richer. Because essentially, when we went to go visit them, this couple... Um, we essentially just did what they did day by day on a weekend. And we did, we planned it great too. Because I think there is a real, this is something people don't mention a lot, right? But there's a real skill in being a good guest to people that you go visit on holiday. I think inevitably, sort of like, have you ever been out sometimes and you're, you know, you're high and shit or you've drank too much and you start making, you know, crazy, ridiculous plans with your friends or sometimes even with strangers, right? You start freaking plotting about going to a festival, starting a business, right? You start doing the most crazy thing because, you you know, you're just full of endorphins and you just think, you know, you want to conquer the world, right? Well, that kind of, I think that happens a lot sometimes too when your friends move away because there's that initial period when they move away and they're a bit lonely, they don't really have that many friends and they just want anyone to visit them, right? They've got probably, you know, if, if they've moved for a reason, if they've moved for some kind of purpose because they want to further their career, they've usually, you know, made some good financial decisions. They save up some money. They've probably got a really great space there. A space that's probably, you know, 10 times what they had in London or wherever else they lived. So they really want to show off their location. Hey, come, man, I've got my You can have your own room, blah, blah. You know what I mean? They're really eager for you to come down because they haven't really settled into the city yet. But it doesn't necessarily mean that when you go there that you should go for a week. It doesn't necessarily mean you should go there and disturb their work week either, right? There's a real skill to knowing how to time your visits so that when you eventually get there, because, you know, it sometimes it does happen, you know, the person wants you to come over and they're really keen to do, want you to come over and you go over there and then, you know, they've finally settled in a bit. They've maybe got a few friends, they've made some plans and they remember, oh shit, my friend's coming to visit me, which basically means they're going to be, you know, um, chained to you like a ball and chain for the whole entire weekend, right? And that can be a bit dodgy too. And so I think that's a real skill in learning how to do it, especially if you're going solo. If you're going with a couple, if you're going with a friend, it's probably okay because, you know, they can, if they want to, just leave you guys alone and tell you to meet them later when they go meet their friends or whatever. It can be a bit easier. But I think when you're solo, you have to do it properly good. You have to kind of plan your visit um, well in advance. And we did quite well. We left on Saturday. No, we left on Friday evening. By the time we got to their place, it was late at night. We had a couple of drinks and we went to bed. Woke up in the morning, had some breakfast at theirs. Went for a massive walk, visited loads of places, shopping, all that malarkey. Came back, had some lunch, had a nap. Woke up again, went for another massive walk, went to more bars and clubs. And then did the same thing on Sunday. So then when Monday rolled around, Monday morning, we were able to go. If anything, I probably would have maybe um, booked us a trip home on the Sunday evening, right? The, le the last train home. But I think the Monday the Monday morning train was pretty cool too. We, we we basically got home. We basically opened the door to our flat at around 11 p.m. You know what I mean? So it was fairly decent. But I do think it's something I don't people don't talk about often, like how to be a good how to be a good guest in other people's houses. Because you do it even at home in your own city, right? You know, if someone's having a house party, that you shouldn't come empty-handed, right? You know, if somebody invites you over, you should maybe offer to order an Uber or Uber Eats or a delivery or something. Right? You know, these little social cues, right? You know, if you invite somebody out for a drink, maybe get the first round. These tiny things are, that need to be left unsaid. But I think 
there's a real skill to like visiting people especially now with brexit and you know people in general you know we're all getting older and stuff everyone's kind of got different ambitions what they want to do there's going to be a period in time where most of your friends might move away you need to know how to kind of navigate that landscape right so um apart from that great um great place i don't have anything more to say really about my visit there um i don't know man it's just it's just really 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 magical place to be um it kind of it kind of lived up to all my expectations and more and i just again man i just i need to emphasize how much better going to a place like um paris is with some friends i'm gonna see if i can get these pictures up actually this mirroring i'm not sure how that works screen mirroring what up but it's something needs to be said about just how much better it is going to a place with your friends right and not just going on your own it's just it's, i don't know i don't know i don't know what to say man. it's just absolutely insane let me see if i can get this up and see how this works um uh, let's see iphone obs mm, screen let's see if it comes up how do you get that on there Ba, 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 ba. so maybe if i go open under sources let me see if i can do sources i can maybe add it on here see if it works media image what should i add here ios camera what is that i don't want that do i mm -hmm. does that work how to what's capture how can i put my screen on there screen mirroring does that work mirroring no does that work or not work how to mirror iphone how to stream from live video feed how do i do that don't know why it's not working there i'm not sure there's a probably way to do it isn't it does that have to mirroring screen to a pc huh. it doesn't matter anyway let's continue this i don't have to use that mirroring thing my skills are not that great but yeah paris is amazing recommend you check it out i left just before fashion week started so um yeah man paris is great paris is a great place to be um again um it's weird how different it is to go to paris on your own and not have a good time but then you go to berlin on your own and have a good time i guess maybe different cities are set up different ways berlin is maybe maybe the most if not the most spontaneous city out there maybe the only closest one is probably New York in that regard, right? It's a city that never sleeps. I remember even though I've been there a long time ago, I went there in, what, 2012 or some shit, um, or 2011. I do remember it being somewhere where you could just literally kind of fall in and out of different places, door to door, and just keep your night rolling, 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 rolling until the sun comes up. Um, you could probably do the same thing in Berlin too, and you could definitely do that on your own because it's so tight. Well, even though Berlin's a bit more sparsely spread out, same as as all great cities are, I think London probably suffers from that a little bit. Usually, every area has to have its little hotspot, its little strip, its little go-to club, bar, its little go-to restaurant, go-to shops, go-to bar. But like, it has to have its little. It has to be um, it has to have its own little ecosystem. So you don't need to go and travel far distances, right? This is my argument against. This is my argument for having um, different venues around London or north, south, east, west that are similar to fold, right? So that guys who live in the west london who want to stay out until 6 a.m they don't have to come way to east to come and party right they can just go to their version of, of fold wherever that may be in west i think that would be quite a good way to kind of spread stuff out so that you know you're not having you know overpopulated clubs and whatever i'm bound to having to turn away tons of people that malarkey but what do i know anyway i'm back now I'm happy to be back actually i'm good happy to be back i, I quite like doing this podcast man because you know all my all my little steady thoughts in my head i can finally get them out and keep that role moving anyway let's move on because the paris conversation may be boring it's you know it's like, it's like when you're at work and someone asks you about your holidays and you start going on a bit too long and you start realizing you start noticing the glazed look on their eyes when they're like look i i, I don't care i was just trying to be pleasant right there's a skill to that too when someone asks you at work oh how's your holiday you don't go on and 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 on about your fucking holiday describing every little intricacy mentioning people who they have no idea who they are no context what they look like ginger small fat girl boy they, they don't know they don't care and you're just going on about these people that you met for you it's an amazing experience it's so vivid but for that person they're just like hey i just i was just trying to be pleasant i saw you passing me in the in the, in the staff's kitchen I, I don't want your fucking autobiography you know what i mean so just rein it in um, there's a real skill to that really people don't do that too often i guess someone i'm probably a prime example of it people just love hearing the sound of their own voice right um you probably hear that you probably see that a lot on reality tv shows 
where they do that thing where they're sitting on the screen and they're like, you know, with the backlit, white lit, and they're like, I'm just trying to, I'm just, I'm just at the point in my life right now where I'm trying to figure out what is best for me. And if no one else can see that, then I'm just going to leave them out of my life. You know, those kind of like empty, vapid sort of like statements people make. <laughs> Mostly, they don't really say nothing. They're just saying the most obvious, low-hanging fruit thing. But, you know, people just like hearing the sound of their own voice, right? Everyone's got their own reality TV show. You have to look at fucking people's Instagram stories nowadays to see, like, you know, everyone's trying to, you know, pretend they're some sort of, you know, person that people should give a shit about, which is... (laughs) Crazy! Anyway, um, here I am. Back again, back again, back again. So, let's get into some topics. Number one topic that I want to talk about, just off, fresh off the plane, fresh off the boat, something I thought was interesting, want to get my grips on it, is... Um, Heron Preston's new collection for Spring Summer 20, which debuted just the other day at Paris Fashion Week. Um, yeah, man, fucking amazing shit. Probably his best collection today. Um, very, f- it's interesting to see just how much these guys' fashion collections develop over time, especially once they get a bit of money behind them, especially when they sure improve. I think fashion is probably a lot like any other industry or most like or most conventional workplaces where you come in with a lot of hype, you might have done a great interview, people might be talking glowingly about you, but there's still kind of, some people in the office still kind of giving you a bit of the side, like, hmm, is this guy or girl good or not, right? Is, is, are they overhyping her? But then once you pass your probation, once you smash on projects, once you come under budget, once you over-deliver on something you promise, right? Suddenly, the fucking gates of heaven open up on you and every opportunity that you didn't even know existed finds its way to you. And I think that happens a lot in fashion too, right? The people that come in with a bit of, you know, a bit of heat, a bit of hype, you know, her impression came off the back of, you know, um, riding um, Virgil's way. Virgil basically introduced him to New God's group, gave him that kind of kick up the bum to say, look, go make a new collection, stop designing t-shirts and hats. And, you know, he got, a, you know, the golden the golden cosign, but as with all cosigns, people don't like to hear it because I guess people are a little bit, you know, I guess when you hear about cosign stuff, it kind of does reflect badly on yourself, right? You sometimes start to feel bad about the fact that you don't have any friends or people of influence that can help you out. I understand. But you need to, some people need to realize that cosigns don't mean you're going to be successful, right? If anything, cosigns probably add more pressure because you're having to not let down your friend, right? And you're having to live up to their expectation of what, because sometimes in life, usually most of the time, this is where good parents, good friends, good partners, you know, whatever they may be, are really important in your life because sometimes in life or most of the time in life you don't think that well of yourself right i think i'm reading this book actually called selfie this really speaks about it really well i mentioned this before haven't i yeah i think i have anyway selfie um how to become self steps right and it's a really great book i'm i'm just approaching the end i've just got about this this much left of it i've tore it tore through it by will store there's a bit in the book towards the end where he says something on the lines of um this whole like selfish self-entitled um self-care all that sort of movement kind of spawned from i think the 80s or 70s movement of um self-empowerment right um or self-actualization or no and and self-esteem that's where it kind of spawned from right this idea that um a person's self-esteem was the greatest was the greatest thing that people had to protect you had to protect someone's self-esteem right you have to make sure people feel good about themselves um but the reality of life is that we don't feel good about ourselves right this that's what pushes us that's what gets me up in the morning at six o'clock to go and do deadlifts and push you know heavy objects over my head because i don't like the way i look at the moment right i'm not happy with how i run i'm not happy with the times i'm making i'm not happy with the level of strength i have those are the things that i'm trying to fix or i'm trying to correct to a point you know where where i am satisfied um but I guess nowadays we live in a world where I think for the most part, if someone says they got a cosign, it kind of feels like they've cheated the system or some way. I don't know. I, some people have that weird thing, but me personally, I've never really felt that. I felt at the end of the day, the cosign is probably the most dangerous thing any creative can get really. And truly, I think most creators would love to come up from the mud from by themselves on their hands and knees, crawling, scraping and, and you know, grabbing any chance that comes their way and making the most out of it. But the common story you hear from most creators is that you don't ever make it on your own it's always a thing that happens within a network you don't you know there's no silo geniuses around it's usually because of a a a various number of things that leads to some person like a virgil like a raf whatever it may be rising up to prominence right loads of different factors plays it's not just your solo genius it's not those we don't live those times anymore or we never probably lived those times anyway if you look back in history and read actually people's accounts of their life whatever it may be um as much as Albert Einstein was an absolute dick to some of the women in his life, they really contribute a lot 
to his overall success, right? And his breakthroughs in life because they were able to handle one side of his life that he wasn't able to kind of handle or to address his family, his children. So there's loads of examples. Anyway, um, long story short, um, I really do think the cosign from Virgil helped Heron Preston, but I do really think he kind of went over and beyond um, really proving that he has a voice in the fashion industry. Um, he has a specific tone. He has a specific um, idea, impression, uh, and just a, yeah, a, a specific idea of what he thinks fashion should look like on the runway. And it's completely different to what you would see from anyone else. And you know what I like about it too? It's unabashedly, right? With no sense of irony, with no sense of kind of a shameless. It's 100% streetwear, sportswear. You know, in the, in, the, in the world we're living in now where you know I, this is kind of i feel like some journalists out there are kind of you know fed up of seeing people like me on the runway or people like you and i designing the clothes or people like you and i in this fashion scene sitting on the runway so they're using these weird kind of coded dog whistles that you know around the, the term i hear they hear that phrase a lot nowadays with fashion journalists oh tailoring is back tailoring is back why because tailoring automatically insinuates that the person that made it went to a prestigious school right or did an apprenticeship right Savile Row or went to a school so that's years in the making it's not like an overnight session because they think everyone that pops now is overnight which isn't necessarily true right you look at Heron Preston's CV and you can see he's been working at this in the various guises for years right and 10 plus years and it's no coincidence too like after the 10 year mark everyone seems to like hit another level it's no especially if you're consistent and you're kind of persistent in what you're doing consistency and persistency consistency and persistence yeah anyway um but it feels like nowadays some journalists are getting fed up with seeing sportswear streetwear on a runway and they're trying to push this narrative that tailoring is back in order to prop up designers who come from more conventional backgrounds i.e fashion schools i.e apprenticeships right and that automatically minuses out the whole group of new breed of fashion designers that are popping up at the moment and i'm really pissed off at it. it really annoys me but the best way to kind of answer your critics, especially if you're creative, is to not address them directly. It's just to carry on creating. Keep making amazing clothes, have people buy them, and just your success is sort of like, you know, the perfect answer to those kind of questions. And in reality, critics, especially journalists, people that sit on show studio, for some for some of them, they're not necessarily consumers of fashion. They're just critics, right? People that critique fashion, they might have a vested interest in other things, whatever it may be, but they're not necessarily the consumer. So they don't necessarily, you know, they don't necessarily have that much of a voice in what you're doing. Um, but I like the fact that Aaron Preston is just unabashedly just going for it. Streetwear and sportswear. This is my lane. I'm not going to deviate from that. And again, look at, looking at how he dresses, looking at the things that he's into, it's, makes fairly, it makes a lot of sense. But just as a caveat off the back of it, looking at it, 100% is the best collection so far. You can definitely see um, what a bit of investment uh, in manufacturing and production can do for your company. I think all the things that, even though Kanye has gone off the, off the, you know, off the reservation has gone a bit nuts over the few last few years and whatever it may be. You can definitely tell, you can definitely see that he had a lot of really, of right. No, he had a lot of, um, he was 100% right when he said, when he was really pushing for production and manufacturing investment in his line easy, right? He was really, really pushing for it, right? Saying that, you know, he needs to create on like a Stella McCartney level, right? Where she's just able to pump out, you know, pristine, immaculate, well put together designs or collections year after year, season after season after season. And now you see why, because it costs a lot to manufacture these, to produce these shows, right? It costs a lot to even just produce the actual show itself, let alone the clothing. So to have such a big group like New Guards group behind you, um, you know, taking the strain of manufacturing off your shoulders and um, having access to some of the best manufacturing and production people in the industry who do everything. Because most of the time, the production warehouses and manufacturing places, they all use the same people, right? There's some people for the same, there's maybe the LVMH group and some other people who have their own factories that no one else uses, but for the most part, everyone shares them. But you need contacts in order to get in. So having New Guards group behind you, Heron Preston, this is what you get. You And there's no coincidence. Heron Preston, um samuel ross virgil a few others you can see the level of of finish has kind of stepped up since they've got the investment but again as a caveat um having known heron and bumped into him a few times here and on the scene and having seen what he's done and knowing that he's not necessarily quote unquote a fashion dude i would more describe him as maybe a style guy hence the kind of you know um cyrillic script that he has on his on his um on his clothing and stuff so um i wouldn't necessarily customize as a quote unquote you know his dream was always to be a fashion designer to see him do this is fucking amazing but also oh i'm so jealous so so jealous whether or not i would ever make my own brand or not is debatable you know maybe i should maybe i haven't done it because i'm a big pussy who knows but 
to see somebody who necessarily isn't in it for the fashion and is in it more so to be a, a creative and just have his little mark on the fashion on the creative timeline um of the scene in general and just be about you know and kind of do his best work and put his vision through clothing and other projects to see him do this on this level is just awe inspiring but it does feel me with the of jealousy i'm not gonna lie it's like wow this guy's fucking smashed it and again like i said like your lump it is what you what you want to say but for what for that kind of area of fashion streetwear sportswear stuff there's nothing better out there i don't think so personally he's really really gone over and beyond and you can see it too because there's a lot of athletes wearing his shit and a lot of um celebrities wearing his stuff now and that's not you know just a coincidence of just style stylists placing stuff on people that's stylists of the said celebrities and athletes noticing oh shit this stuff looks well good on my client will look good um on this person that i'm representing and will kind of compliment them overall and again i think that goes to show just how popular his things are you know the, so many stockists whatever it's just insane anyway let's get to the collection and stop jacking him off um here we go uh, yeah overall great collection um great bits of quote-unquote tailoring um i like his kind of um i like his interpretation of a suit I think you got a suit here with like a drawstring, it looks like. So like a drawstring you see on a down jacket. Oh, that is actually down. Oh, that is actually, it looks like it might be down or quilted the entire thing. That's amazing. I love that. So it's like quilted pants um, and a blazer with sort of zip ties on the waistband. I love the logo too on the outside. I think that's a really um, clever little uh, branding piece that he's done on most of his clothing. It kind of reminds me of those old horrible, it's, he sort of elevated those horrible logos that you get on like Moss Bros or tm lewin suits they used to rent back in the day to go to prom and all that shit right they're horrible logos you just unpick them straight away but he's kind of upgraded it by having like his crazy nice little branding on the side of it so all back when someone sees you wearing it they notice the kind of safety orange because you know it's synonymous with his brand now which again a clever thing because you know look at virgil in a white and black sort of like cross thing at the back which i hate as a logo but it's synonymous with uh, off-white same with um this orange color it's synonymous now with Helen preston it's really, really clever, 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 clever branding. Again, it goes back to Serena. You know, that's what I said. He's not a fashion dude. He's a creative marketing guy that's been able to... And this is probably a good experiment. I wonder if we're going to see this later on in, in later on in in in, in future years. Um, more marketeers and branding guys coming into fashion. Maybe as a collective. Maybe, you know, the solo person doesn't exist or there won't be that many of them. But maybe collectives like, you know... Imagine if a fuck Jerry decided to do a clothing collection, even though they're not, you know, they're not the pest resistance at the moment now. They're inside. But imagine somebody like that, an ad agency came in and did their own clothing brand. If whether or not they could actually be on point, I reckon they could. Right? They could just probably, you know, analyze algorithms and shit, um, use that as a mood board, and probably put stuff. Out. I don't know. I wonder if that will happen because I, I think this hair and person ex experiment has been pretty successful so far. Um, so yeah great take on suiting i love the suits um nice sheer tops there obviously that belt is something of real beauty i really like the mechanism on the on the belt that he has really clever take on it and it kind of loops around the front oh i love the actual little side bag too a little personal side too looks really really great the sneakers are interesting too on here right i think they're quite modular similar to the elite sneaker where you can kind of it's a boot inside of a it's a boot inside of a little cage thing I'm sure there's a collaboration with Nike. I'm pretty sure because Heron Preston's got like a good history with Nike. So I'm pretty sure there might be a collaboration with Nike. I have to check that later. Again, great dresses. Dresses, you know, I think Bella Hadid is obviously his muse. Or, Be you know, Bella Hadid, right? It's Bella Hadid where it's quite a lot of Heron Preston. And of course, Off-White. But you can definitely see the muse that he's trying to go for. The, the there's I love the heels and sort of like heels, heel slide things, right? With the Velcro strap on the front, but also heels with Nike socks look incredible. This suit here, the yellow suit, is probably the big stand-up piece. I think a lot of people were sharing on social uh, the other day. It looks amazing with the um, uh, babushka headscarf with a little pin strap on there. It looks absolutely incredible. Big fan of that. Again, just great styling tips. Nothing really crazy in terms of referencing all that malarkey. Just really clever twists and interpretations of staple pieces in your wardrobe. You know, a great little rain jacket here. Uh, Gore-Tex that's actually... Oh, clever dude. He's flipped it inside. I'm not sure if this is styling or this is a actual finished product, but it's a Gore-Tex jacket that's essentially been flipped inside out. So you can see all the um, heat press seams that are on the inside, which are usually the most interesting part of a Gore-Tex jacket. Whenever I've had one, you know, looking at your kind of tape seams on the inside, it's always quite cool to see. Um, so that's pretty interesting. Maybe not the most breathable thing in the world, but, you know, still, who cares about breathability when you want to swag out on people? Um, I love the pants too. 
um, essentially look a little bit like cargo work. I mean, Carhartt work pants that look really great as well. Again, just a great um, iteration and, and you know um, of the stuff that he actually wears himself. The boots, the big pants. Uh, everything's quite boxy fitting, which I'm a big fan of. This jacket is probably my favorite so far I've seen. Um, it's sort of like um, would you call it a coach jacket or work jacket? I've got that kind of jacket. It's called um, mechanics jacket. It's sort of like a crop jacket with two front pockets, a zip pocket on the front another big flat pocket on the top but I, I like the massive zip i like the little detail in the middle of the jacket too that makes it look like there's another zip on there i love the new logo he has here heron with the with the style thing on there i love the short shorts which look great as well so i've seen a lot of the short shorts actually this this season so this is the shoes they look quite modular to me right look like they kind of sat in they look really nice so i'm really a big fan of those Again, just great collection. Great pieces for women as well. Nice crop jeans. That shirt, that blue flame shirt is going to be everywhere. For sure, you're going to see that everywhere. That's a definitely, definitely a crop. I love the shoes from last season. I think those are there as well. Um, just an overall great, great collection from Heron. I think, again, easily his best collection so far. Oh, I love the chain. That's amazing. There's a chain here. Uh, bolt chain with a, with like a little um, orange carabiner sort of thing that clips it together, which looks fucking awesome. Big fan again. Those heels, those high heel slide things are such a clever, clever, clever flip on slides. An upgrade on it. So essentially like a Yeezy slide, but with a high heel on the back of it. They're gonna be crazy um successful with some of those Instagram girls that love wearing hair and press and stuff. Especially these athletic sort of like inspired things. They're gonna be all over that. I love the bags kind of strapped on the neck as a neck as a necklace. Another great jacket too. Boots with the socks. Just great, great, great silhouettes overall. Again, very clever take in um, flip on sportswear um, and streetwear done unabashedly, unashamedly. You know, he's got streetwear pass. He's not ashamed of it. And he's just showing it on the highest platform that exists, isn't it? Paris Runway, man. Absolutely incredible. Easily one of my favorite collections so far I've seen uh, thus far. But I just wanted to mention it because, you know, it just happened the other day. And why not? I love the Babushka scars things. But again, you know, if Asa Rocky does it, I'm not going to do it. It's a bit cringe that way, isn't it? But, oh, that denim suit is nice. Yeah, I think it's all a bit cringe, isn't it? The Bushka thing, you know, it looks good on Ace Rocky, but the moment you do it, you immediately look like an Ace Rocky clone, isn't it? And no one wants to do that, really. You know, he sets a tempo on his side. You want to set a tempo on your side. But I love this pink denim suit. Not sure if it's going to come in men's. Hopefully it does, because I saw the, the trousers on, the, on some guys too. That, I don't know, what is what is that? Is that coated or something? I love the little sheen on the denim. I think it might be coated. It might, maybe it's coated. I don't know. That bag as well on the waist, like, whew. Clever little styling piece. This is great. I wonder who style. I wonder who styles these collections. The styling is awesome. This show too. Oh, I love. I love the little peeking out of the underwear too. Those sweats look great. Um, yeah, great collection, man. Easily his best so far, without a shadow of a doubt. I think he reached up to the levels. You can definitely see all this stuff being worn by real people on Instagram who buy it, and by obviously athletes and all that malarkey. That jacket and suit combo is so good. Yeah, so definitely be able to see this on one way very soon. And there's your main man there at the end. Again, insanely jealous, man. Considering he's not a quote unquote fashion guy, he's coming to this just as a, a, a you know, a real hyper creative marketing guy with crazy ideas that he probably wants to get on the run, which maybe is, I think maybe fashion is such an, it's interesting, right? The way fashion critics treat streetwear people or people from our scene. They kind of poo-poo us. But if anything, we kind of get involved there because it's the easiest entry level into other things, right? The moment you can prove yourself on the fashion platform, on the especially Parisian fashion platform, which is, you know, um, super, super, super critical and really hard to get into. But if you can prove yourself on that, on that stage, it automatically allows you to jump into other arenas, right? So in some way, in some guises or in some way, street people are kind of getting into fashion because the easiest route in, which is kind of ironic considering how you know, stand up as some of these guys can be. But, you know, everyone's got their way of doing things. But, yeah, congratulations to Heron. Great collection. Um, Easily one of my standouts so far in the opening couple of weeks. Opening couple of days, actually. All the big hitters are going to come um this week and the next week as well. So, watch out for that, I guess. Uh, what else is next on here that I saw? Oh, second thing I wanted to mention, which is interesting, was, you know, cancel culture. Because Dolce Gabbana are still getting featured on Vogue, which goes to show cancel culture is a bit of a myth, really, isn't it? Right? Remember the whole Dolce Gabbana thing? Uh, they did that Chinese New Year celebration where they had the girl um, eating Italian food with chopsticks or some shit. Like, really, you know, a bit classless, a bit tasteless, a little bit, you know, whatever it may be. Um, um, cultural appropriation. I don't know, whatever you want to call these buzzwords, right? But it, it just tasteless, right? A bit tacky. Then Stefano Gabbana came out on social and just, you know, his usual 
um, you know, snarky, you know, bit dickhead this self. And it seemed as if, like, you know, brands were cancelling it, loads of Chinese customers were burning their stuff, returning it, the stock was going down, they issued a public apology. But it seems like everything is all forgiven because no no matter who they call to come and run, walk their runway, it seems like no one really has any objection. They all kind of sign up, pay the, um, sign the contract, and, you know, and get paid and walk the runway. Um, again, which goes to show that I think cancel culture in fashion just hasn't seemed... I don't think it's really taken a hold and i think it's a good thing right in general i'm a real big i'm not gonna say it's a bad thing but i think it also goes to show what maybe the wider society should maybe take an example of i think fashion people are maybe very aware that they're not you know no one is perfect they're not all standing on some kind of moral superiority to others i think the moment they try to cancel one person they're afraid that they might then have the you know cannon pointing in their direction which you know never to be happens in the wider world anyway right the moment someone is rabbiting on about one thing, you know, who's that recently? There was a really liberal journalist recently who was always espousing, you know, male feminist kind of POVs on Twitter who recently got nabbed for, you know, um, essentially um, trying to meet up with underage girls online, right? And, you know, and have and allegedly um, having a hard drive full of uh, child porn and stuff, right? So usually the people that are screaming the loudest, pointing lies are usually the ones that are hiding the most skeletons, usually, right? Not all the time. So I think some people in fashion are very aware that if they try to, you know, become the moral police and try and oust Dolce Gabbana from the fashion circuit, that eventually one of their favorite brands is going to fall by the wayside too, because no one's perfect. Um, but yeah, just, just interesting to see, just as an observation. Um, I'm not sure what this says about anybody. I'm not sure if it says in general fashion people are just, you know, way too about the actual clothes and being at the runway show in order to kind of really because i don't know what if what anyone would have to do to really give up their seat because someone else will take it from you in an instant it's sort of like you know when united fans debate that oh people should go on strike and give back the season ticket holders season tickets because my United are not investing right in their team and ed woodward is fucking up our club and the players don't care blah blah, blah. but the common you know re retort back is like yeah if you give up your season ticket for one of the biggest clubs in the world, there'll be a queue of people willing to take your seat, right? The same will be said for fashion, right? The moment you take the moral stance, you're not going to go to a Dolce Gabbana show. There's tons of people who don't give a fuck about all this social justice shit who are going to line up and take your front row seat, right? And some. Um, same with models. So, yeah, interesting. Um, this little article from Vogue, written by Luke Leach, again, highlighting some of the, you know, um, silhouettes that adorn the Dolce Gabbana runway. Nothing too extravagant, nothing too crazy. But I, do have, I have heard a couple people say on social that the suit supposedly fit amazing. Again, I've never touched a raw Dolce Gabbana piece in my life, so I don't know what they taste fit like. But I don't know. It's always the same shit on the runway. I never really get that excited for it. I think the one question I was super excited for it was a really, they do a lot, but the super heavy Catholicism one, the one where people, the guys dress up like literally like priests, I thought that was nuts. I love that one. Uh, but for the most part, I've never really been that bothered about Dolce Gabbana. So, yeah. Um, interesting just to see, in general, just how the counterculture thing didn't work. They're, it looks like they stopped using influencers, maybe on the runway too. They were having that period of time where they were getting all the influencers to walk on the runway. But I guess influencers are, you know, they have backbones of fucking Spanish. They have no backbone, really. So, you know, they're not the first people to kind of stand up next to you and kind of, you know, um, ride with you during the stormy weather so they probably backed out of it and just got regular models in but again yeah never really been the biggest you know it's a bit too even for my liking it's a bit too gaudy like um but this will look great on a you'd wish more guys would wear something like this on a red carpet in it right you're definitely gonna see someone wear something like this. this is crazy it's like what is it? like a purple sequin blazer with is that leopard print lapels <laughs> and and the same kind of color pants and loafers with massive bows on it. it looks essentially just dripping in wealth it's insane how good that looks but most most guys just opt for the standard white blazer black trousers sort of combo to go a little bit jazzy but that looks insane that's a great look some stylists should definitely pick up for someone of their actors and actresses whatever it may be but yeah um i don't know what this is about those Gabbana. i don't know but it's interesting to see cancer culture doesn't necessarily work in fashion does it no one's really got cancer in fashion who terry richardson bruce weber but i'm probably sure they're still working now in the background without having their names credited i'm pretty sure um that's about it really isn't it? no one has really got cancelled in fashion really the same way that they have in larger society i wonder why that is i wonder anyway let's move on let's move on there's also an article here about a couple of lads a couple of model lads hanging out um doing model model lad things but you know less said about that the better let's move on and see some other topics i might want to talk about here 
go through the list. What's going on here? What we got? 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 Okay, let's go on. Let's go on a snarky fashion IG central, also known as uh, Diet Proud, and see what they're talking about. What they're outraged about, right? Because um, they're always a funny group of people to go and hang out with, right? Imagine, imagine hanging out with the Diet Prada guys, right? And talking about fashion, man. Like, just be snark levels supreme. Oh, don't like anything. Everything shit. Uh. But anyway, let's go. Let's see what this, let's see what these guys are talking about. Um, where is it? Uh, you got it on here? Do you got it on here? Let's see what Diet Prada are talking about here. So, Diet Prada have this interesting post about post. Sorry about um, our girl, uh, Kendall Jenner, maybe the second smartest Ken Jenner of the whole Jenners and all that malarkey. So this is interesting, right? Supposedly, this is meant to be some kind of weird ad. I saw a picture which was quite cool, right? I saw a really cool image someone posted on social media. Yeah, this is the one, right? So interesting to see it say the least right and but in my sense as a marketing guy right i've had uh, i have over five years maybe 10 years experience working in marketing content marketing community management uh brand partnerships i'm a lucky um i'm a big fan of reading you know back in the days i love reading guerrilla marketing books now it's got a bit pastiche and a bit you know over the top but in general i'm a big fan of um the attention economy right and what brands are willing to do in order to grab people's attention how conniving they can be, how innovative can they can be, how brazen they can be. You need to look at KFC and Burger King and the desperation to have any kind of attention, any eyes is good eyes. And sometimes the clever um, ways they do things like this new BuzzFeed article I saw the other day where they kind of highlighted that this supposedly quite mundane Instagram um, account of this um, um, builder working on a construction site was actually a front for a coffee brand promoting their brand of coffee, which, I, which kind of just got rumbled recently. But this story is really interesting. So, there's this image I saw of Kendall Jenner post on social the other, the other day, randomly, right? This really cool CCTV image of Kendall Jenner supposedly buying a can of Coke in a bodega somewhere, right? Looking incredible, right? Kendall Jenner probably, I'd say aesthetically, out of all the Jenners, out of all the Kardashians, maybe the most stunning to look at, right? As a, as a female, because she just has probably the most, she has the less work done of anyone. She's got a, essentially quite an athletic figure. She tends to work out quite often. And just has a very sexy vibe about her in general, right? So there's amazing CCTV image that she's kind of captured or someone's taken for her, maybe behind a screenshot of her basically leaning on a counter, kind of strewn, bending back, amazing silhouette, wearing this great kind of yellowy orange uh, dress, great high heels, paying for her drink in a, in a, in a, in a bodega, okay? Nothing to see here, cool. Therefore, nothing of it kept her moving, right? But supposedly that product is saying that this was whole this was an entire marketing scheme employ in order to kind of um, get this new orange uh vanilla coca-cola out to the masses so the post on diet product says the following um i i've got it here on the screen but if you're really reading listening via the podcast i'll read it out now um diet product says um hashtag ad Short-lived Pepsi spokesmodel Kendall Jenner, again, snarky out of us, made a glamorous uh, bodega run in New York City yesterday to grab a can of Coke. It wasn't just any Coke, though. The most recently launched orange vanilla, which sounds very tasty, flavor she chose happened to just be a couple Pantone shades away from uh, perfectly matching her dress. Yeah, cool. And the earrings, too, it looks like, right? Gold earrings. She just she looks really good, doesn't she? Bloody hell. She's stunning. Um... Surely enough, images of her with the beverage were soon splashed all over the web. Was this color harmony a coincidence or had the Jenna Coca-Cola been scheming to skirt around the FTC social media advertising guidelines? Which probably is true, right? Because nowadays, if you're branding, if you're kind of promoting something, you have to do the whole hashtag ad thing. But I guess some brands and some influencers feels like it cheapens. I'm, I'm sure some influencers, probably especially the good ones, the really the ones that are super picky about who they associate with and they don't just, you know, anything that comes to the inbox, they take. But the ones that are really picky are probably really picky about what goes on their feed, even the captions. And, and they really think maybe the hashtag ad thing cheapens their overall social media feed. I know some people were accusing someone similar. It might have been the other Hadid of doing that during Coachella when she was... Um, promoting mcdonald's right and it was just like come on you don't eat mcdonald's right you look amazing amazing we don't eat mcdonald's um so a way to get around it is maybe to have these weird guerrilla tactic things where you seemingly have a 
you know, a run the mill celebrity buying a run the mill item, and then only later does the correlation come between, you know, oh yeah, shit, I want to buy that thing. Um, for me personally, looking from the outside in as a marketing guy, I think it's genius. I think if this is true, and if it was a, a ploy between Coca Cola and Pepsi, Coca Cola and Kendall Jenner, great um, advertising, great marketing, because essentially when I see that kind of Coke, I'm going to go buy it myself and have a little taste. I don't drink Coke in general, but I'll definitely taste that. I think it's definitely a little bit more refined and well done than the whole Pepsi campaign, which made no sense. You know, Kendall Jenner isn't a political activist. She doesn't, you know, no one goes to her for societal um, POVs. Um, it was weird that they wanted to have her be the spokesperson for this whole, like, you know, have a kind of Pepsi. It stops war, stops conflict. We can come together in harmony. Really very, very strange. Um, even though the optics of it were weird anyway, but just choosing Kendall as the person was strange. I think if they would have picked that Zedenia girl from Euphoria, who's kind of a bit woke and social justice kind of vibe, she would have probably made more sense to the Pepsi campaign. This didn't make any sense. Cool. This makes a lot more sense, right? It's done very tasteful. It's in New York. She's going to Bodega to buy a drink, which, you know, doesn't make sense because she would definitely get mobbed if she was in that Bodega on her own just buying a can of Coke. Um, and I don't know if you... if the I don't know if the first thing you'd want to do wearing a dress like that and looking the way she does is buy a can of Coke to get you bloated. Probably isn't the first thing you want to do. Or maybe it is. It's a hot day. You want to have a cool beverage. It might be a good thing. But I think it's very cleverly done, personally. I'm a big fan of it. Um... There's some other screenshots here that kind of prove um, that this might be a ploy in general. But I don't know, man. I don't know. Um, again, Diet Prada aren't, mess aren't the best source because they're, you know, they're fans of anything popular, you know, anything mainstream, anything out there to the masses. They're not really a big fan of. I think if this was Raph Simmons or, you know, Helmet Lang, they would have probably all wanking themselves over it. But, you know, because it's the Jenners, it kind of cheapens it for them. But I don't know. If it is a ploy, I'm not mad at it, man. I think it looks pretty cool. And it's worked for me because I'm definitely going to get myself an orange vanilla Coca-Cola. I wonder what that tastes like, isn't it? Imagine mixing an orange vanilla Coca-Cola with Ciroc vanilla vodka. Woo! Woo what a taste of that would be, right? That's a collaboration I want to see. But yeah, um, that was one. Let's move on from there. Oh, what else can we want to see here? What else do we want to see here? Okay, let's go into some topics that I had for the thing. I talked about Paris already. Paris um, weekend. Uh, oh, this is a good topic. When is it too much uh, to be DJing and drinking? This is a little thing snippet I saw uh, from an interview with uh, Louisa and a girl called Monkey who I wasn't really familiar with. I think Monkey signed to Defective Records. She's obviously she's, she's um also a, f a professional footballer women's footballer which is fucking nuts she plays football and she djs to a high level again i'm not sure why i think i mentioned before haven't i previously right that um this whole uh 50 50 split on venues and the festivals between male and female is a bit stupid and arcane because essentially the problem isn't that women are represented on lineups the problem is that it's the same kind of guys representing the lineups, right? It's not everyone's suffering, even dudes. We all suffer because it's the same type of guys, the same names that are built for the same festivals, you know, year in, year out, or same stages, the same clubs. Because most of the time, promoters don't want to take a chance, don't want to take a risk, don't want to take a hit on the door or on the bar. They want to make sure they get guaranteed money in through the deals because most metropolitan cities, you know, the, the closing times are getting sure and sure and sure. There's not enough time for them to make money. I get it. But in general, the issue isn't just females it's in general right there's not enough djs outside of the top 50 that are getting represented on lineups so with that being said um i was saying earlier that i think what's weird is that even though there's been a, a concerted effort from the scene to push a certain crop of female djs it still feels like to me that they're repeating the same issues that happen in the male dj circles right where essentially the top five percent of djs or female djs that have been pushed to the forefront the Peggy Goose, the Black Madonnas, the Charlotte, the, the Charlotte the Wits, the Amelie Lenz, the Nina Kravitz, whoever you know, even though they've all got you know years of experience, they're the ones that are really being pushed to the forefront, and maybe a few others. Um, the issue is that it's just repeating the same circle, the cycle that happened before, right? With the Richie Hortons, the Lucianos, the Seth Chocolas, well, it's kind of it's just repeating the same sort of process. And then what ends up happening is that there's other girls or other people in general that should be getting props that aren't really getting props because they're not the flavor of the month they're not trendy i don't know whatever it is that's, that's a shame so that being said i stumbled upon this dj called louisa who's insanely good right she signed i think to brodinsky Records. she's got her own um label too called Ra or something along those lines she plays electro it's insane you know I, I was a big fan of electro back in the day you know um ed banger records you know that that whole period of time was insane seeing 
Busy P, Busy P play, play one of his first sort of like DJ sets in the UK at Not New Arts Club was, was an experience I would never forget. Bumping into MIA, MIA there, great experience. But again, great DJ, but you know, maybe someone that isn't maybe in a cultural zeitgeist at the moment. And even putting her to one side, Monkey, that DJ, right, who I just only found out about today, she's a female DJ of, you know, of high regard, signed to Defective Records, so a pro, got touring DJ. And she also plays professional football, right? I think she plays for QPR or some shit like that. It's insane, right? That's a story that you'd probably want to see promoted and spoken about more often, right? Like this girl that that has two careers, like at a high level, two real 1% careers. Like, I don't know, you know, the amount of girls out there playing football is high, right? The amount of girls playing professional football is low, right? They're both really hard professionals to kind of get to the top of. And they, you don't hear anything about them, um, which is a shame. But anyway... This little clip between both of these girls kind of speaking about, you know, the general struggles that come with being a DJ and also having him being involved in the hedonistic lifestyle that, you know, you're kind of attached with when it comes to being in the nightclub and how you can kind of balance the two. It's a really cool little video. I'm going to play it now for you guys and then kind of speak about it on the other side. Where is it here? There we go. Boom. The sound is up. Let's see what they got to talk about. There we go. Bang. <laughs> areas of the music industry, especially rock, have um, awareness around addiction and recovery in a way that dance music totally doesn't, yep. which is bizarre considering that like we talk about hedonism here and like a lot of people are partying constantly. And for some people that is awesome and it works really well and it's super fun. And for <laughs> people it becomes a monster. It's probably one of the only Which is interesting, right? Because um I, that's very true. I also get the impression that some people are kind of... A, it's weird, right? Because nightlife culture or, you know, the electronic scene in general, we're all very aware that it's very hedonistic. It's very prone to, you know, overindulgence in alcohol and drugs, right? This is something that we all can't escape. We know that's a fact. But I also get the feeling sometimes that some people are ashamed of admitting this f fact, right? It's, a, it's kind of whispered that people are taking drugs or people are drinking a bit too much or might have a problem with drinking or are going out too much and it's ruined their career it's all kind of hush hush don't really hear stuff being spoken about in the open um which is the complete opposite to rock which um louisa mentioned because you only have to read um whose book i've got here steven tyler's book from aerosmith i have oh who's the other guy i have steven tyler from aerosmith um and also Keith Richards book Life, right? You have to read those two autobiographies from two, you know, rock and roll legends to know that, you know, it's part and parcel to admit, like, especially now since Steven Tyler and and um Keith Richards have you know are probably what? On the other side of sixty. So they've lived enough of a life to kind of admit and even if you see Steven Tyler when he was on Joe Rogan podcast, right? He could sit down and reflect and say, Yeah, I did tons of gear back in the day. I drank a lot. I smashed all the ladies and stuff, but now I'm at a point in my career where I can kind of look back and think, fuck, how did, how did, how did, how did I survive that, right? But it's a kind of cautionary tale to loads of artists coming up. So what you have now is a whole generation of rock and roll stars or indie guys who are looking at those guys as an example and thinking, you know what, how am I going to start my journey? Am I going to indulge and just see what that kind of lifestyle tastes like? Or am I going to say, you know what, I'm going to stay off it because I've already got two good examples of people saying, look, all my friends died, but I was lucky to survive, right? Because Keith Richards and Steve Tyler aren't saying they're special they're saying that they were lucky to survive but i think that honesty and that admission up front really helps a whole generation of artists out there who are coming up because they get to see okay cool that's the bad side of things right but in electronic music we don't really get that it's all kind of hushy hushy and everyone tries to pretend like it's not happening when it obviously is happening um which then leads to people coming into the scene quite naive and a bit you know um googly eyed and thinking you know this is what everyone does when it's not necessarily everyone does especially when you get down to the core of it you start really looking at people's social feed and you start to really analyze the interviews or read between lines a lot of the highest performing djs most of them you have to look at someone like uh, james uh, seth truckster for example i'll keep mentioning he was very open about you know the deterioration of his first relationship i think he was engaged to a girl prior when he was really popping and that kind of relationship deteriorating was in large part due to his um star or his stock in the electronic scene rising right which meant he was touring more uh, which meant he was overindulging more in alcohol and drugs, whatever it may be, and his relationship deteriorated, right? To a point where they had a, they kind of had to break up, and he's you know he's in a whole different space. But he's very upfront about it. He was probably the only one that was kind of upfront about, hey, you probably don't want to go as fast as I did, or you don't want to you don't want to blow up and become the darling of the scene because essentially the scene's gonna chew out, spit you back out again, right? You have to see a Vici to see that story, right? Somebody who was kind of lauded as this kind of you know um, mercurial talent 
He was kind of basically ground into the, uh, grinded into the ground by his management team, right? Into a point where he excessive, you know, he got to a point of excess where he's dying at the age of 26, 27 due to, you know, alcohol poisoning, which is insane, right? Or liver failure, whatever it may be, due to alcohol um, abuse. Um, again, I wish there was more of open conversation about it. I think in certain scenes, it isn't open. I think in Germany and Berlin, it definitely is. I've definitely seen a lot of um, drug awareness advisors in nightclubs talking to people who are going on bad trips or just in general, advising people to kind of like take it easy. I've seen a lot of kind of, you know, in general, like I mentioned it previously, loads of times to friends who have been in Berlin or Bergheim, especially who've tried to take drugs on the dance floor and they've been told, no, go to the toilet, take your time, relax. This is a safe space. Don't ruin it for everybody. I've just seen, you know, I don't know. Uh, there, there's not much as a mix of it overall there needs to be more of a conversation about what you know what that kind of lifestyle is and what it takes to and i guess and i think like i mentioned previously most of the top guys and girls out there aren't doing anything right because especially when they're playing that you can't balance both things i think most people know like you most people have played tipsy most people have played high and you can tell the difference between coming in sober and coming in high it's night and day you can't perform at your best intoxicated or under the influence of anything it's not going to get you that far but again that needs to be said in public like hey i've done it for a long time in my career but now i'm at this point in my career i can't do it anymore there used to be more of that being said but no one really does anyway let's continue here what monkey has to say clubs in the world where you're sort of expected to at least or like to have a party with the promoters or whatever and when you turn up and you're like no no it's okay i'll just have a bottle of water you can all particularly oh damn the biggest to find the right so the main thing oh, i lost it what she say? that's actually what's happening to me you can almost see like the disappointment on people's faces. <laughs> oh, really? Like, you're not coming to rave? It's like, yeah, I'm coming to rave, just like, I can't get drunk because I've got shit to do tomorrow. Like, and that's the balance that I'm trying to make at the moment. I think I've, I've reached a point where, especially, you know, I'm DJing every weekend, Friday, Saturday, this Friday at Tap East, next Friday at Tap East, Saturday at Free Compasses, and again, and again, and again, and again. The good thing about it is that I don't go out as much, right? Because I'm DJing so much, essentially my DJ um, gigs have now kind of replaced my going out because I get the, you know, I've mentioned it previously. I love going out. I love hanging around with strangers, getting drunk, having a good time, dancing. I love that vibe. So obviously DJing naturally fit my kind of overall interest, just hanging out with people in general in nighttime. But I kind of get my hit of hanging out with people just by DJing, by playing their songs or playing something they like, playing something they don't like, hearing their requests, just generally, you know, interacting with people on the dance floor, I get that hit. So I don't need to go out again and get it again. Cool. But the problem with it is that sometimes in order to kind of get that kind of um, awkwardness off me and to kind of feel relaxed in the environment I'm in, I need to have a drink, right? I can't, I've tried to do it sober for a month. I did, I think I DJed for the entirety of Sober October for one month, not touching anything. And I fucking hate it, right? Going into a nightclub, especially into a bar. Uh, most of you guys will know if, you, if you're sober, going to hang out with your, with your mates that drink is the worst, right? Imagine going behind the DJ booth and playing songs for people and people wanting to talk to you or invading your personal space, whatever. It's just not the best combination. So I find it very difficult to go into a nightclub completely sober. I need something to take off the edge and kind of make me a bit relaxed and loose and not be so, you know, self-aware of what's going on around me. But there's a real balance again to it because I've noticed that at times I've been completely sober, I've played amazing, but I've had to go through a real difficult half an hour, 45 minutes where I'm kind of struggling and I feel clunky. I feel like I'm playing bullshit. Then I hit my stride. But sometimes that little, you know, the little shot, the little kind of, you know, um, the little, um, little bit of liquor here and there, maybe a little bit of whiskey, a beer or something, just to kind of get the sheen off really does help to kind of settle the nerves and get you down. But the idea that you're going to go behind a booth and rave and dance and dr be drunk or whatever and play a good set is null and void. That isn't going to happen. It's definitely going to. It's definitely not going to be the way you think it's going to be. So, I think that whole sort of stigma of like everyone has to be like on it or drinking or whatever. Like, dude, if we did that like three times a week, it's it's hard. Like, people can't do that. You can't stay. You can't stay healthy like physically and mentally. Exactly. Well, some people can, but I definitely can't. So I think that whole stigma needs to be like lowered or at least at least dropped. I think so can... And I found that myself too. I think that's a really good point they both made there. I think the stigma for me has been lowered or dropped in general, I think, nowadays. There's a lot of high profile DJs who are doing that whole um Kundalini yoga thing or going to retreats, going to ayahuasca retreats, going to just like um isolation retreats, uh where you don't have any electronics or whatever, you just kind of meditate for a period of days. There's 
there's a few of them now set up, I think, in Bali too. A few people from the scene have moved out there and set up kind of camps and retreats that DJs go to, have been reset. Because I can imagine, on my tiny amateur novice scale, DJing in local bars and pubs, it gets stressful, right? Balancing that with a 9 to 5, it gets a bit stressful. I'm essentially working Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. Then on Fridays, I come home, change, wash, shower, go and play from 7 to 11 on Saturday, go and play again from 9 to... It, it can get a bit, you know, a bit much of, over time. So I can only imagine what it must be like for a touring DJ, right? Like she mentioned, you're playing three times a week, three to five times a week, right? In different cities around the world because they're different because they're playing professional. So they're not even just playing in the same city. They're traveling to places in Europe, America, Asia. Again, again, playing, playing, playing. I mean, playing, playing, playing. So imagine adding on top of that the idea of alcohol and stuff, right? Already, you know, depletes you, makes you tired, lethargic, whatever it may be. It's not necessarily conducive to a healthy lifestyle. But what I found really helps, especially nowadays, is that I've kind of limited or kind of deleted the idea of drinking Monday to Friday, right? I don't drink at all Monday to Friday unless I'm playing on a Friday. So it might be Sunday to Thursday to make that a week, right? I deleted, I don't have any drinks at home. I only have drinks when I go out. So if I'm going out to a place, that's why I'm going to have a bit of alcohol. If I'm with DJing, I might have a drink there, but nothing in my house to kind of tempt me. And then I also have a regimen of always doing a workout in the morning. I'll try doing it in the evening a couple of times, but it gave me an excuse to get a bit drunk some previous days. So what I do now is that I always have to work out first thing in the morning. Well, every time I wake up in the morning, especially before work, I have to, it, not at the moment, I'm trying to, I'm basically um, navigating between waking up between five and seven in the morning. So anytime between those three hours, I have to go and exercise. Whether it's going for a run or going to the gym, I have to do some exercise. Because what that does is that it inevitably, you know, wakes you up, makes you a bit tired throughout the day. And then essentially it gives you a buffer against any kind of distraction when it comes to booze or anything, right? You're not necessarily going to fuck yourself up if you just, you know, got yourself up out of bed at six in the morning to go for a run to full 40 minutes. It doesn't make sense to go and then waste it all by drinking, right? So it kind of gives you a bit of a balance. And then what happens is that the next day, it kind of sets up the next day again because, you know, you have something to look forward to. So when I'm going DJing now and I have a run I'm going to do on Saturday morning, I can't go hard on a Friday because I want to wake up and go for my run the first thing in the morning. So it kind of, again, gives that kind of buffer. I think those kind of things, in my, in my, for me, my experience, having those kind of bookends really helps to kind of keep me on the straight and narrow. But again, I think nowadays with the new generation of artists coming up, I think it's some conversation that needs to be said uh, quite widely and often, especially, you know, with this initiative to get more girls involved or whatever it may be. Some girls are going to come into it, you know, with not much, that much experience, quite young naive so, so loads of guys too they really need these kind of elder statesmen or elder states women to really kind of be honest and say hey i was also a fuckhead i was getting on it way too much and this is what happened this is the opportunities i lost blah blah blah, blah. but don't repeat my same mistakes because we don't want it to get to a point where you know we have many other episodes of you know whatever happened to jack master happening to other people too because that's just an, that's an example of just excess right somebody just being too excessive going over the top and then finally catching up to them Hopefully it doesn't happen again, 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 again. But, you know, people maybe have to live through these spirits instead of being maybe told. I don't know. Anyway, I don't know much. But what I do know is that that's the end of the Exynos English show. It's been an hour. It's zipped by. As you can tell, I'm happy to be back again. I'm going to see you guys again tomorrow for another episode of the show. But for now, thanks for tuning in. It's been a pleasure. As always, if you're listening via the audio podcast, please leave me a five-star review as that helps people find out about my show and all that malarkey. If you're watching via YouTube, give me a like and subscribe. Leave me a comment if you have anything interesting to say. If you have nothing to say, don't comment because it's going to hurt my feelings. <laughs> but apart from that, I guess I'll see you guys on the other side. Um, sometime very, very, very soon. Why is it not coming? Hide, hide, hide. Oh, Jesus Christ. Anyway, I'll see you guys again on the other side sometime very, very soon. <laughs> Take care and see you again. Peace.